Hi everybody. Today we're going to talk about the cells of the nervous system. Your brain is like every other part of your body in that it consists of cells. You really are a collection of many, many trillions of cells. Uh, and your brain is no different. If we were to take your brain and slice it like this, you would see something like this on the lower right hand corner. This is a, a section of the brain, and you can see there are different colors of tissue. There's this darker stuff around the edge, this lighter stuff in the middle. Uh, we'll talk more about those a little bit later. But let's zoom in again. So now we're going to zoom in on one section of this folded outside part of the brain. And if you do that, and you take a, a thin slice of that part of the brain, and you stain it in just the right way to highlight the neurons themselves, the, the functional uh, the electrically active neuro cells of the brain, you'd see something like this. So these dark areas here are stained neurons. They're not all the neurons, uh, but they're a subset of the neurons that are there. And if we zoom in even more, like in this little spot right here, you would see you might see something like this. Now this is not a, a, a microscope slide. This is an artist's rendering that shows you the relationship of certain kinds of, of neurons in three dimensions, uh, but it gives you a sense of, of what you're looking at. You'll have the neurons themselves and another type of cell called glia, which we'll talk about, and then there's fluid in between, uh, interstitial fluid it's called, or the interstice. The first insights that we gained into the microscopic structure of the brain came largely from this guy here, Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He was a Spanish histologist, someone who uses careful staining and uh, dissection techniques to look at tissues under a microscope. And uh, as you can see, he won the Nobel Prize in 1906 for his, his contributions to understanding the microscopic structure of the brain. Here's a quote from him that I, I really like. He wrote in his, uh, his autobiography that like the entomologist in search of brightly colored butterflies, my attention hunted in the garden of gray matter, cells with delicate and elegant forms, the mysterious butterflies of the soul, the beatings of whose wings may someday, who knows, reveal the secrets of mental life. I really love this quote because, it, A, it's, it's poetic in his, his view of what he's doing here, but also he foreshadows what it is that we're doing today. At the time he was working, we didn't have a way to record or measure the activity of these, these neurons, these butterflies of the soul. Uh, but he, he predicted that eventually understanding what those little guys are doing would tell us about how it is that our brain works. And now we have those tools and we're, we are starting to reveal the secrets of mental life by measuring and recording and even manipulating the beatings of his butterflies of the soul. One of the, the staining methods that Ramon y Cajal relied on was known as the Golgi method, uh, named after another histologist working at the same time named Camillo Golgi, a, uh, an Italian scientist with whom he shared the Nobel Prize in 1906. Uh, and Golgi developed the staining technique. Up until this time, uh, it was very, very difficult to visualize individual cells in the brain and the rest of the nervous system. The Golgi method, uh, also called the Golgi stain or silver impregna impregnation method, is, was a, a revolutionary new tool because it stained individual cells, but it didn't stain all of them. If you were to stain all of the neurons in a, a section of, uh, of the cortex, let's say, or another section of the brain, it would be almost impossible to figure out where one neuron ends and where another one begins. It would just be lots and lots of little black lines and it would look like a mess. Uh, but for reasons that still are poorly understood, only some of the neurons take up the stain. And importantly, the whole neuron becomes stained. So you can see its entire shape shown here. This is called a pyramidal cell. Uh, it's got a pyramid-shaped cell body, a long axon coming out the bottom. We find these mainly in the cortex. Uh, 
of mammals and other animals. Ramon y Cajal relied heavily on this and other staining techniques. And it allowed him and his contemporaries to really start unraveling the microscopic structure of the nervous system. This is uh, a drawing uh, of Santiago Ramon y Cajal doing what he did for most of his career, looking at carefully prepared uh, specimens underneath the microscope and then painstakingly reproducing with pen and ink what he saw on these preparations. Cajal wanted to be an artist as a young man, but his father uh, sort of forced him into medicine, but he ended up combining these two, these two interests in his career to great effect. In the background here, you can see just some of the, uh, the chemicals that would have been used to help prepare these slides to highlight specific aspects of the tissues that he was looking at. These are some of his illustrations. This is showing you a little section of cat cerebellar cortex. You can see the Purkinje cells here. These are some of the largest neurons in the nervous system, along with basket cells. You can see where they get their name. This is a section of the human cortex, that sort of crinkly outer covering of the brain. This is the outside surface of the brain. And here you can see the pyramidal cells that we saw earlier. So here's that slide showing you a stained pyramidal cell. And these are some of Cajal's drawings of these same kinds of cells. And you can see how accurate his drawings were. Cajal made some uh, many important contributions to our understanding of the microscopic structure of the body, uh, especially the brain. But two of the contributions he's most known for are what's known as the neuron doctrine. Uh, up until Cajal, there was uh, there was debate as to how, this, how the brain was structured. Cajal and others believed that the nervous system was composed of contiguous but not continuous individual elements or cells called neurons. Now, Cajal didn't come up with the term neuron, but he adopted it. Uh, so Cajal, when he looked, under these, looked at these slides, he saw individual elements, individual cells that were contiguous, meaning that were one-ended the next one began. They were practically touching each other uh, and communicating with each other. Others, however, including, um, including Camilo Golgi, who developed the Golgi stain, they saw a reticulum. So Golgi proposed what he called a reticular theory, that there was kind of a web in the brain, lots of interconnecting filaments that were all a piece of one large web or network as opposed to individual discrete elements. It turns out that Cajal was right. Uh, the nervous system and the rest of the body is composed of individual cells that we now call neurons. Cajal also gave us what's known as the law of dynamic polarization. Looking carefully at the structure of individual cells and how they were connected with one another, he proposed that each neuron transferred information in only one direction, that the dynamism, the movement of each neuron was polarized. There was an information receiving end, in this case over here, the dendrites and the cell body, and that information in the form of elect now we not what we now know are electrical signals was transferred in one direction only down to the synaptic terminals here. So it's the law of dynamic polarization. Information only moves in one direction within a neuron. So how many, how many neurons are we talking about here? In the human nervous system, uh, there are a lot of neurons. How many? So there are roughly 100 billion neurons. To give you a sense of how many that is, that's going to be 1 followed by 13 zeros. This is a huge number, a huge number. And each one of these neurons is connected with uh, points of chemical communication, usually chemical communication, with roughly 1,000 to 10,000 other neurons. So on the low end, we can estimate that there's roughly 100 trillion synapses, or points of communication, between neurons in the human nervous system. So I, I think we can be forgiven for not having figured everything out 
quite yet. That said, it's not all chaos. There's order to these connections. There are repeating patterns of, of structure in different parts of the nervous system. Uh, there are principles of organization that repeat themselves over and over again. So uh, it, it's not quite as, as difficult as the situation might seem. Let's back up a little bit and tar start talking about the structure of cells in general. So all the cells in your body have a similar kind of structure. Uh, let's talk a little bit about that structure and then we'll move on and talk about what's special about neurons. Every cell in your body has a cell membrane. It's composed of two layers of fat molecules. Uh, it allows some small uncharged molecules to flow into and out of the cell. Uh, but by and large, most chemicals have to be brought in actively or let through some special channel. Here's the, the cell membrane in this model cell here. It's sort of an envelope that surrounds every living cell. If we zoom in on it, it would look something like this. So this would be the outside of the cell, and then this would be the inside of the cell right here. And here you've got the cell membrane itself. You can see it's composed of these phospholipid molecules. It's got a, each of these molecules has a phosphate head and two lipid tails. Lipid is another word for fat. The fats tend to gravitate toward one another. Uh, this is a, and they tend to, to want to go away from water. The phosphate heads are hydrophilic. They like water. So they tend to gather toward the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell, which is filled with fluid. And then the hydrophobic tails tend to gravitate toward one another. Embedded in this membrane are protein molecules. This is giving you a little flavor of what's to come. These protein molecules are absolutely crucial to how every cell in your body works, and neurons are no exception. These protein molecules that you're seeing embedded in this membrane are ion channels. They let charged particles in or out of the neuron, which as we'll see later is central to how they work. Next up is the nucleus of the cell. Uh, just about every cell in your body has a nucleus. Your red blood cells no longer have a nucleus, but other than that, every cell has a nucleus. And the nucleus contains the chromosomes, which are made of DNA, which we'll talk more about later. These essentially contain the instructions to make proteins. Those proteins are kind of little machines, little molecular machines that allow the cell to do everything that it does. And the there, the instructions to make those little machines is contained on the DNA inside the nucleus. Another structure that's inside every cell is the mitochondria. Mitochondrion is plural. Mitochondria is, I'm sorry, mitochondrion is singular. Mitochondria is plural. So here's one mitochondrion and several mitochondria within the cell. These produce a product called ATP adenosine triphosphate. This is a molecule that stores energy in a very convenient form that's used to perform all sorts of cellular functions. The, uh, the mitochondria take uh, products made from glucose. So glucose is a simple sugar that's running through your bloodstreams right now and all the time. And inside the cell, that's converted into other products by way of a process called glycolysis. And then the mitochondria take those products and convert them into ATP. Why bother? Why, why go through this process? An analogy would be uh, using, let's say, diesel fuel in order to run your blender. You could use diesel fuel to run a blender. You could have a, a diesel-powered refrigerator. Uh, all the little appliances in your kitchen could, could run on diesel, but it's just not very efficient to do it that way. It's, it makes more sense. It's more convenient to convert diesel fuel, let's say, into electricity. Electricity is easy to use, it's clean, uh, and that's sort of what the cell does. The ATP is a very convenient source of energy. What happens is that uh, the adenosine molecule has three phosphate uh, molecules attached, and each one of those contains energy. Each, each one of the bonds between the phosphate uh, molecules and the adenosine molecule contains energy. And 
When you pop off that phosphate, you release the energy, and that can be used to run all sorts of functions inside the cell. We'll see a lot of those functions later on in the semester. Interestingly, the mitochondria also have their own DNA, separate from the DNA inside the nucleus. This is nuclear DNA. Inside the mitochondria are mitochondrial DNA. And these actually have a known rate of mutation. So we can look at the mitochondrial DNA from, let's say, you and some other human, or the mitochondrial DNA from one group of people and compare it to another group of people. We can even look at the mitochondrial DNA across species and look at how different the DNA is. Look, at the, look for the number of mutations that have occurred, and we can estimate how far back in time uh, those two people or those two groups of people or those two species shared a common ancestor. Interestingly, these mitochondria only come from your mother. So the nuclear DNA comes from both mom and dad, but the mitochondria only come from the egg. And so the mitochondrial DNA are only present, uh, only contains the DNA from your mother. Next up are the ribosomes. Those are shown here in blue. Uh, these are the sites of protein synthesis. They're really, uh, they're, they're a protein uh, complex in and of themselves that takes the instructions to make a protein from the nucleus and converts it into a, uh, into a protein, as we'll see a little bit later. Next up is the endoplasmic reticulum. You can think of this as kind of like the UPS system of the cell. It uh, transports proteins and other products from one part of the cell to another where they're needed. And then the Golgi apparatus is sort of like the, the packaging station where the, the boxes are uh, packed up. Okay, now that we've learned something about the structure of cells in general, the important structures within all cells in your body, Let's talk about what's specific to neurons. Here you've got kind of a prototypical neuron. This is the soma, or cell body. The word soma is the Greek word for body. <clears throat> Hanging off it are a bunch of dendrites right here. Dendra is the Greek word for, for branch or tree. and These are kind of like little trees or branches coming off. Often the dendrites are covered with dendritic spines. These serve to increase the surface area of the dendrites and create more locations for other neurons to come and make synapses with this neuron. What's not shown in this figure is hundreds or thousands of other axons from other neurons coming in and making synapses or points of communication with this neuron. So this is receiving signals from tens to hundreds to thousands of other neurons. And most of those connections happen here on the dendrites, the dendritic spines, and in some cases on the soma. So this is the information receiving end of the cell. The axon hillock is sort of the base of the axon, this very long fiber that comes out of the soma. And this carries signals over long distances. It's like a cable, in a way, uh, carrying neural signals over long distances. You can see that it's covered with a myelin sheath. We'll talk more about the myelin sheath in a little bit. This is really the cell membrane of another cell wrapped around the axon. And then finally, at the end of the axon are the presynaptic terminals or the terminal buttons which then make synapses or points of communication with other cells. Inside the brain, this is, these other cells are typically going to be other neurons. So over here you might have the soma and dendrites of one or more other neurons. In this case though, this particular neuron is called a motor neuron because it's conducting its impulses, its signals, to muscles and glands. So if this was a motor neuron that, let's say, controlled a muscle in my finger, the soma and dendrites here would be inside my spinal cord. They would receive information from my brain, so other axons coming down from my brain would make synapses with the soma and dendrites of this neuron, 
which would then relay the signals all the way down my arm. So you can see that this axon is broken here. It's because it's not drawn to scale. Uh, this axon, if this soma was in my spinal cord, it would be microscopic. But nonetheless, this axon would be long enough to reach all the way down my arm and uh, it would form an, a nerve with lots of other axons. And it would carry the signal to move a particular muscle all the way down my arm and then down to, let's say, a muscle that controls my finger somewhere in my forearm or in my hand. And it would send that signal to the muscle fiber and tell it to contract and move the finger. Here's another kind of neuron. This is a sensory neuron. In this case, it's a neuron that senses touch. So if I were to touch the surface of the skin, let's say on my finger, I feel it. What's really happening though is that that mechanical change in the shape of the skin is being converted into an electrical chemical signal that we'll talk about soon called an action potential or a nerve impulse. And that signal or nerve impulse is then carried all the way down the axon, in this case, into my spinal cord. So again, this isn't drawn to scale. You can see that the, the figure is broken here. This axon would be very, very long if this was drawn to scale. So the signal travels down the axon all the way to the central nervous system. And then here are the presynaptic terminals again, which are going to make synapses with other neurons, which then relay that signal up to my brain and allow, it, allow me to become aware of the touch way out on the skin, let's say on my finger. Okay, now let's put all these neurons together into a kind of circuit, it's kind of a simple circuit just to illustrate uh, how the circuitry within the nervous system works. So here you've got a patch of skin and this is that sensory neuron. Let's say this is a patch of skin on my finger. The sensory neuron's axon will travel all the way up my arm and into the dorsal root of my spinal cord. So this is a cross section through the spinal cord here. Dorsal means toward the back. Uh, so this nerve here, this bundle of axons, comes in on the back part of the spinal cord. And then here you see some motor neurons. The motor neurons leave the spinal cord on the ventral root, on the ventral side. Uh, that's toward the belly. And you can see these axons then go out and they form part of a nerve and eventually make synapses with motor neurons, or I'm sorry, with muscles, which then contract. Here though, I've drawn in an interneuron. So in some cases, you have reflexes, spinal reflexes, where a signal coming from, let's say, sensory receptors uh, out on the skin can then immediately, or almost immediately, trigger muscle contractions. As an example, there's something called the nociceptive reflex or the pain withdrawal reflex. If you touch something very hot, your hand will start to withdraw even before the signal has really been processed by your brain. That's your a spinal reflex uh, that's intended to uh, to protect you, to keep to minimize tissue damage in the case of touching something very very hot or something very painful. I'd like you to start thinking of all behavior this way. I've just described a very simple behavior, touching something hot and withdrawing your hand. Now, of course, you're consciously aware of it and that leads to all sorts of other behaviors and to learning. You learn not to touch hot things. But at its root, you've got this very simple little machine. Signals sensing pain, sending that signal into the spinal cord, which then triggers contraction of specific muscles to try and withdraw the hand and take away the painful stimulus. I'd like you to start thinking of all behavior this way. Now, the behaviors can get very, very complicated, and instead of having just three neurons with just three or so synapses, you're going to have hundreds of millions, if not billions, of neurons participating in very complex behaviors. But the principles are still the same. It's always just neurons and synapses neurons communicating with one another at synapses and forming large, often complicated circuits that perform certain kinds of functions.
Now, neurons don't always look like the ones that I've already shown you. They come in lots of different shapes and lots of different sizes. This is showing you a Purkinje cell. Uh, this is showing you a, a sort of stylized pyramidal cell. These Purkinje cells we find in the cerebellum. These are some of the largest neurons in the nervous system. These we find in the cerebral cortex. These are showing you sensory neurons, kind of like the ones we saw that respond to touch that I showed you earlier. Notice that the cell bodies, are, or somas, are kind of hanging off the axons partway along their length. This is a bipolar neuron, which we'll find in, in the eye. And this is called a Kenyan cell. We find these in the honeybees. These are enormous neurons that have very complex functions. Neurons are the, the main cell type in the nervous system that we're going to be talking about for the rest of the semester, mainly because they're the cell type that plays the most important role in information processing in the brain. But there's another class of cells in the brain that are uh, at least as important, but they serve primarily support functions for information processing. Mainly, they help the neurons do what they do. And those are the glia, or glial cells, also called neuroglia. And the, uh, the word glia is actually the, the Greek word for glue. Uh, and it was originally thought that that was their only function. Uh, but now we know they do more than that. There are some glial cells that, uh, that do play a role in supporting and maintaining the structure of the nervous system. But we now know that they play lots of other roles, too. So they're the other major component of the nervous system besides neurons. They have lots of different functions, but importantly, they don't really transmit information and they don't really process information or transform it the way neurons do. There are about 10 glia for every one neuron in the brain. So there are many more glial cells than there are neurons, but they tend to be quite a bit smaller. In fact, on average, they're about 10 times smaller. So by volume, uh, the, the cellular structure of the brain is about half glia and half neurons. This is showing you just some of the, the types of glial cells, the main, the most important types. Let's start with these two here. So one role of glial cells is to insulate axons. So these long rod-shaped structures here are axons. And you can see they're surrounded by myelin sheath. In the peripheral nervous system, outside the brain, in the nerves of the, the uh, your arms and other parts of your body, the axons are surrounded by Schwann cells. Schwann cells form the, uh, the myelin. In the central nervous system, though, oligodendrocytes form the myelin sheath. And you can see that one oligodendrocyte can actually form a, a section of myelin <clears throat> for multiple axons. So here's your myelin sheath broken in, in spots with uh, nodes of Ranvier, which we'll talk about later. In the peripheral nervous system, though, again, the Schwann cells cover one part of one axon. In the central nervous system, oligodendrocytes form. In the central nervous system, by the way, is the brain and the spinal cord. Oligodendrocytes form the myelin there. So that's one role that uh, glial cells play is insulating and uh, protecting axons. Another role is supporting the, the function of the neurons. Uh, they do that in a few different ways. For example, astrocytes, you can see this astrocyte, named for the fact that it kind of looks like a star, uh, is hugged, snugged right up against a capillary, a tiny blood vessel inside the brain. And one of its main roles is to provide nutrients from the blood vessels and provide them to surrounding neurons. They also sometimes play a role in removing waste products from the neurons and depositing them into the blood vessels to be removed. Over here, you've got microglia. As the name imply, they're much, much smaller than these, what are called macroglia. And unlike the astrocytes and the oligodendrocytes and the Schwann cells, the microglia are mobile. They can actually move around, not very quickly, but they can move around inside the nervous system. And their main role is to fight off infections. They, uh, they will fight off pathogens if any make it through the blood-brain barrier, uh, viruses, bacteria, that kind of thing. They also tend to clean up the mess. Uh, if a neuron dies, they'll help 
uh, sort of break down the parts and recycle them. And then finally, you've got radioglia. Here the radioglia is shown uh, as this rod. It almost looks like an axon in these other figures, but in this case the rod is the radioglia. We'll talk more about these when we get to the development chapter, but you can see that this neuron is migrating along the radioglia. It's almost climbing up it like a pole. Uh, these radioglia are used in early development in the embryo stage to allow uh, migrating neurons to go from one place to another. There's sort of like a, a road map or roads along which migration can take place early in development. So just to summarize, housekeeping is one important class of functions that glial play. For example, astrocytes and microglia. The astrocytes do kind of basic housekeeping, providing uh, nutrients and taking away waste products. Microglia mainly uh, serve as kind of a, a local, um, local immune system for the, the nervous system. Axon insulation is another important function of glia, forming the myelin that surrounds axons and helps speed up nerve signals. Oligodendrocytes are the glial cells that do that in the central nervous system, in the brain and spinal cord. And Schwann cells do that in the peripheral nervous system, outside the brain and spinal cord, in your, in your nerves. And finally, they help guide axons during development. Radioglia are the name of the glial cells that do that. There's another function that's only really become apparent in the last few years, which is that uh, it turns out astrocytes and certain other types of glial cells can actually help synchronize neurons. They can help local groups of neurons coordinate their activity. So in that way, they do actually play a small role in information processing. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about the blood-brain barrier. You may know that the blood-brain barrier serves to protect the brain. It creates, as the name implies, a, a kind of barrier that keeps pathogens like virus and bacteria and, uh, and harmful chemicals, toxic chemicals, out of the brain to protect the neurons there. Uh, but this raises a question. Why do we have this, this special barrier for the brain, but not for other organs of the body? Other organs of the body. I would argue that uh, other organs of the body are just as important, just as necessary for life as the brain is. There's something important, though, that you need to know about the brain to understand why we have this special barrier. And that's that neurons don't regenerate. All the other cell types in your body can regenerate themselves. You make new blood cells all the time. If you cut yourself, your skin heals, your muscles, your liver, liver even your heart cells can regenerate. Uh, the structure of these organs is simple enough that when part of it gets destroyed, it can just regenerate to a degree. But the brain is different. Neurons in the brain don't regenerate. If you lose some neurons, they don't come back. It turns out we do make some new neurons, even as adults, but that's pretty rare. Uh, it constitutes relatively few neurons compared to the total number of neurons in the brain. And it's not clear to what degree those new neurons integrate with the brain after they're formed. But that raises another question. Why? Why is it that uh, the brain can't regenerate itself? Why is such an important organ unable to uh, just repair the tissue that gets damaged? And the reason is, is that there's no other uh, place where the structure of the brain is stored. Your brain got to have the structure that it has as a result of a lifetime of learning. When you learn something new, it physically changes the brain. The brain is the, the substrate of learning. It's like the hard drive. Um, if you erase the hard drive, you can't just get it back. There's no backup anywhere for what's on that hard drive. Uh, the brain is kind of like your hard drive. It's, it's a, an accumulation of all your experiences, all your learning, as well as all the, the intricate steps that occurred in development early on in life. And there's no re recreating that as an adult. So it's very, very important that we keep those neurons the way they are to maintain our learning, to maintain our knowledge, to maintain ourselves. So that's why we need it. Certain things can cross passively through the blood-brain barrier. It doesn't keep everything out. For example, small uncharged molecules like carbon dioxide, like oxygen, 
uh, water, those things can pass through pretty easily. Lipid soluble molecules. Lipid is another word for fat, so things that dissolve in oil or fat can generally get through the blood-brain barrier pretty easily. Certain drugs, for example THC and uh, uh, others, can cross through because they're soluble in fat. Heroin, heroin and THC are examples. So then, what has to be actively transported? And the answer is pretty much everything else. So what that means is that everything else that your brain needs, everything else that your neurons need to survive, things like um, the building blocks of proteins, amino acids, things like glucose, the simple sugar that they use for a source of energy, um, things like, well, a whole host of, of things, uh, all need to be actively transported in. And that takes energy. In fact, it takes a lot of energy. Um, this is why, probably, we don't have a blood toe barrier or uh, a barrier for any other organ in the body. Even though it might be helpful to be able to keep pathogens and, and toxic chemicals out of the other parts of the body, it just comes at too high a cost in terms of the energy needed to keep that stuff out. This is showing you the blood-brain barrier. It's probably not what you were picturing. You might have been picturing kind of a a sac surrounding the brain, but that's not the case. In fact, it's just modified blood vessels. So this is showing you a blood vessel, a capillary, a very fine blood vessel uh, that carries blood through the body, including red blood cells and white blood cells. In most of your body, the cells that make up the wall of the blood vessels, these endothelial cells, have loose junctions between them. They're kind of floppy and loose, and things can get through in between the endothelial cells. But that's not the case in the brain. In the brain, you can see that those cell wall junctions are tight. Things tend not to get through the, uh, the capillary wall unless they go through one of these endothelial cells. What can get through? So again, fat-soluble molecules can get through. Small, uncharged molecules like carbon dioxide and oxygen, they can get through because because they can make it through the cell membrane, and specifically the membranes of these endothelial cells. But you can see glucose and amino acids, for example, those have to be actively transported through the blood-brain barrier. And that takes energy. It takes ATP. There are specialized proteins embedded in the membranes of these endothelial cells whose job it is to move amino acids from the blood into the, uh, the interstitial fluid in the brain, the brain tissue. Same thing with glucose. Drugs that aren't able to make it in the brain through being fat-soluble often hitch a ride on these active transport mechanisms. And while the blood-brain barrier is good for protecting the brain, it, it can also make treating the brain difficult um, when it comes time to deliver drugs. So, for example, um, creating drugs that treat neurological disorders or brain disorders is very, very difficult because not only does the drug have to interact with the brain in a very specific way, but it also has to make it through this blood-brain barrier. It also makes it hard to deliver, uh, for example, chemotherapy drugs to the brain.